boy, Megalodon J. And I got a special guest for you guys today. Before I introduce her, I have to tell you, it is a beautiful Monday afternoon, and I got Miss Lauren Williams. How you doing today? I am doing wonderful. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. How did your weekend go? I had a great weekend. In Dallas, the weather is beautiful. It is a great time of the year to be outdoors. Once it, You know, you start at like 60s in the morning, you get up to like 80, but not like the hot 80. Um, so it was really, really nice to be outside. Did a pumpkin patch, went, did the shooting range, did some shotguns, you know, typical Texas stuff. Shooting range? Yeah. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you are not familiar with Lauren Williams, you're going to get real familiar with Miss Lauren Williams. This is actually the first lady to ever medal in the summer and the winter games, Olympic games, I'm sorry. And, and I, I can't tell you how incredible that is. Um, you guys, it's, it's hard enough to, to, to even make it to any type of Olympics. And she went to the summer and winter Olympics. And she is in a exclusive group of four people with her being the only American woman to ever do that. That is, that is very impressive. And she also has under her belt, 2005 100 meter champion talk to us about it miss lauren i have had a really nice run at sports so i went to four olympic games and was fortunate to have a career that spanned over 10 years we know the average athlete lasts maybe three to five years in the pro sports world and i was just really lucky to be able to participate in sports for that long but also be able to travel all over the world and see new cultures see different places uh, learns all kinds of different things that, you know, living in my little small town of Pennsylvania wouldn't have shown me. So, yeah, I'm just blessed. So one thing that I would like to really, really ask you, I want to jump into this real quick because, you know, as you can see, I, I, I have locks on my head. And um, it's very rare that I see a lot of people have sister locks. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about what what inspired you or, or what made you want to go with 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 the the sister locks and leave away from what people would deem to be the traditional look. Yeah, for me, it was all about ease and simplicity. So with my hair, I just didn't like to comb it. Like I, I don't have that knack, you know, everybody has their own thing. Some females are into, you know, makeup and shoes and fashion and all of that. And you know, I was a little tomboy. Um, so it was like, I, I'm not into all of that and I don't have a lot of time to be doing my hair. And when I was pressing it and it'd get frizzy and then living in Miami, you're, and you're working out, you're sweating all the time. It was just like, this is a lot to be trying to manage. Um, and you know, God made our hair some sort of way. It is what it is texture wise. Like what else can I do? And so for me, these skinny locks were like, because it looks kind of like hair. So it's like, I can still style it in the way that hair you know, can be styled and do a lot of different things with it. Um, but I'm not, I can also just wake up and walk out the door and it's not like inappropriate per se. So um, it was the best thing that I ever did. You know, my hair is like halfway down my back at this point. And I started with just hair like mm, maybe one inch long when I got, got, <laughs> got going. So 10 years later, yeah, I'm really happy. And my hair didn't grow as well when I um, didn't have sister lock. So I'd get to about shoulder length and then it would start to break. Uh, for one reason or another. And now, you know, like I said, it's halfway down my back. All right. Well, you, hey, I, I had to ask because, you know, I, I, I love locks, obviously. And, and you see, I have Bob back here. So that was definitely one of the questions that I definitely wanted to ask you. Um, so post-career, post I, 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 something that jumped out to me about you that, that I, I really, really love. I love anybody that's trying to uh, help uh, professional athletes, people of business minds, uh, aspiring business uh, owners, you know, people that, that are really, really trying to grow uh, exponentially. And I noticed that, that you, you wrote a book. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, the Oval Office, please? Yes. Um, so the Oval Office is the name of my book. You know, the track is shaped is like an oval. So I thought it was a fitting name because that's where we do our work every day as professional track and field athletes. So um for me, it was a labor of love. So I'm not a natural born writer. It's not something I enjoy. I think I write pretty well, but 
overall, it's not something that I'm super excited about doing. However, I felt like the sport needed something. So, you know, the big sports have like the NBA draft or the NFL draft and the combine. And there's a whole process that you kind of go through. Whereas in track and field, it's like you just get thrown into the muck and it's like, figure it out the best way you can. Best of luck to you. Um, and We're agents are coming turn, out though. of the wood. Yeah, it's crazy. Like agents are coming out of the woodwork or maybe they're not coming out of the woodwork because you're not a high, you know, a high, uh, high level athlete. And so then it's like, well, what if I want to continue and I don't know how to manage or navigate this? So the book, like I said, is my gift back to the sport to help athletes know what they should be looking out for, how to make better decisions, what to be thinking about as they, you know, change cities and countries and uh, all the little different things. And, you know, some of it can be very costly. What we don't realize is that overnight you become a business owner as a, as a professional athlete and you've got to be managing your team. And most professional athletes come from a college setting where they were being paid to go to school or, you know, they were getting a scholarship or some, some sort of, and they had the obligation to show up for practice overnight yeah. that switches on them. And so maybe they even stay with their college coach, but now you're paying the college coach to coach you <laughs> and you need to be able to, you know, delegate to them and tell them what you can and you can't do. And, um, you know, maintain a level of professionalism, even though they're older than you and they've been kind of bossing you around up to this point. Um, and it's a hard transition to make. So that's what the book's all about is helping athletes be able to sort through that. That, that takes a lot, man, to, to really want to go out and actually put that on paper because I think, with a lot of different things is we have a lot of professional athletes out here and, and I vent about it all the time. They, they're, they're first generation of wealth. Some, some of them. And then they, they go into this, this whole new realm of, of money things. And then five to six years later, they're, they're working at like a McDonald's or, or, or somewhere. Not that there's anything wrong with working at McDonald's, but it's it's like you don't work hard to go back to where you came from. And and that there, when I seen that you wrote a book about that, I said, Oh, I have to ask her about it because I need to know. I need to know what inspired that. That 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 just it made my heart just just boom because I love anybody that's trying to help somebody be self aware of their situation. Yeah. I mean, it's so important for people in general. It's not just an athlete thing. Mm -hmm. Financial literacy is something that we're struggling with nationwide. Uh, they're not teaching it in schools. They're, you know, not teaching it in households. There's a lot of, you know, rhetoric and marketing and stuff that tells us we should be quiet about our money and, you know, don't tell anybody about your finances and, you know, ball till you fall. Like there's just so many messages that we're getting that are not encouraging us to make good decisions with our money that it's not just the athletes that are ending up in situations. And it's easy because people see them on television. So they know that their earnings are high. Um, but it doesn't matter if you got a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars, if you don't know what to do with it, the result is going to be the same. So I, the thing I loathe the most is, is people saying, Oh, I can't believe he spent $10 million. I would have <laughs> never did that with him. Like, well, you got $100 and you, you blew it. So don't think that because you got 10 million, it's just going to magically overnight flip for you. If you don't know what to do, you don't know what to do, period. Um, and it doesn't make you exempt from, you know, being responsible with what you have. So being a low earner or not even a low earner, an average earner in America um, doesn't prohibit you from making good financial decisions and, and learning as much as you can about money to optimize your own personal finances. So you have been all over the place country different countries different states you're in dallas right now when i met you you were in the woodlands um <laughs> you know talk to me a little bit about how everything has been going since the pandemic hit because you know we, we were all moving around quite a bit well at least i was you know and, and i know you probably were too and and then pandemic came and it was like ah! <laughs> How, how have you adjusted to your, your schedule now since the pandemic has hit? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic definitely made me slow down. And I think it was a good thing because, like you said, in America, we're taught, you know, work, grind, hard, go, fast, you know, like all these like, rah, just very aggressive terms. We just got to wake up and be stressed out all the time. And, you, you know, you don't realize how much you get into the rhythm of that and you're just kind of spinning your wheels. So um, it was a welcome sort of sit down somewhere, Lauren, 
recollect yourself, you know, re, um, you know, think about what path you want to go on. So I, I was grateful for it from that perspective, but I've definitely been itching to get back on the road. The other thing it's encouraged me to do is to see a little bit more of the United States. You know, we can't get out of the country right now for the most part. Yeah. So um, I've been making trips, you know, locally to various different places and planning trips nearby and yeah, just trying to see what America has to offer as it pertains to other little small towns. Um, so I'm looking forward to hopefully that before the end of the year, I'm going to go to Mount Rushmore. And my mm. other goal is, um, what's the, the place? Uh, Yellowstone National Park. That's what I'd like ah. to do. But we'll see. I've never been to Yellowstone National Park. I want to go. Yeah, I think it'll be really cool. So 